I'm starting at somewhat of a disadvantage today because David Roth has stolen my fire, so to speak, by <laughs> talking about much of what I wanted to talk about, but I hope he doesn't suffer the same penalty as Prometheus. <laughs> Or maybe I am hoping that you do. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> what, one of the words we've heard over the past few days is about the principles. Principles, what are the things that makes theosophy distinct? One of the teachings that you really find only in theosophy is this idea of these seven principles. Madame Blavatsky was one of the first thinkers in modern times to see man as a psychological entity. When she started writing, it was either body or soul. Those were the two divisions of the individual. And she really is one of the pioneers of psychological thinking before Freud, before Jung, to see the human being as a psycho-physical complex. As early as her first book, Isis Unveiled, which precedes the secret doctrine by 10 years in 1877, she actually uses the word principles. And I'll just give you one of the passages here. When one falls into a love of self and a love of the world with its pleasures, losing the divine love of God and of the neighbor, he falls from life to death. The higher principles which constitute the essential elements of his humanity perish, and he lives only on the natural plane of his faculties. Physically, he exists. Spiritually, he is dead. So she actually does use this term principles. And she also, in Isis, does give a sevenfold system. She uses the Egyptian system, so she refers to um, body, an astral form, I'm not going to give you the Egyptian terms, animal soul or life principle, the higher soul, and terrestrial intelligence. They also had a sixth principle, or the mummy. So she's actually, there is in embryo this sevenfold system. But this idea of the principles is truly, truly something that is unique to theosophy and um, makes our system identifiable as theosophical. In one of the stanzas in The Secret Doctrine, this is the quote it gives. The breath, the human monad, needed a form. The fathers gave it. The breath needed a gross body. The earth molded it. The breath needed the spirit of life. The solar laws breathed it into its form. The breath needed a mirror of its body. We gave it our own, said the Dianis. The breath needed a vehicle of desires. It has it, said the drainer of the waters. The breath needed a mind to embrace the universe. Mm. We cannot give it that, said the fathers. I never had it, said the spirit of the earth. The form would be consumed if I gave it mine, said the great solar fire. And nascent man remained an empty, senseless form. So as uh, David and others have pointed out, the theosophical idea of the human being shows three distinct series of evolutions. There is the material, physical evolution. There is this monastic mind, this wonderful mind, the thinking principle, because the word man comes, of course, from manas. It's a thinking being. And, of course, this monadic essence. And so I just want us to look at this idea of these principles. In, in theosophy, sometimes, of course, we talk about a higher self, Atman. In most of the books you are going to read, the seven principles, of course, are the physical body, uh, 
prana, life, the astral double, kama, desire, uh, mind, higher mind, and of course buddhi, and atma. Now to her own students though, of course, she gave a different teaching, the esoteric teaching. She said that was really good for the public, but she has an esoteric clarification which we're going to deal with. And in fact, I'm going to give you throughout this some of her own words, not her written words, but her actual, not the handout, <laughs> which is uh, sort of an elaboration of yesterday, and I want to thank Thomas for copying this. Uh, you left out, I see though, uh, this is from Femi Rijek, who some of you may know at Norton. This was a commentary of her ideas on a similar uh, seminar that we gave for the 125th anniversary of the Theosophical Society that was sponsored by the Dutch section at Narden. So what we did yesterday, it's interesting to see someone else's commentary. So I'm going to give you some of her own words from something that is forthcoming. This is her actual own commentaries on the secret doctrine in dialogue, so to speak. And this is one of them. I'll give you some others. It's, it's a little long, but bear with me, please. This is what, in conversation, when they're asking her all these questions, she said, you Europeans ought never to have been given the seven principles. Well, perhaps in a hundred years you will understand it. It would be a thousand times better to hold to the old methods, those that I have held to in Isis Unveiled, and to speak about triple man, spirit, soul, matter. Then you would not fall into the heresies, in such heresies as you do. Why do we divide this into seven parts or aspects? Because ours is the highest philosophy. But for the general mortal, certainly it, would, it is a great deal easier to understand them if we say that man is triple. He has got a spirit, soul, and matter. <coughs> so, we always talk about these seven principles. You'll see them pretty well in every basic introduction to theosophy. But nobody really says, well, where do they come from? How do they develop? Of course, using the old hermetic axiom as above, so below, we can say, well, the universal principles are there, and of course humanity has them. But as she points out, man, or humanity, man is the measure of all things. So by know thyself, knowing ourself, we really get a glimpse of the universal principles. So one of the clues she gives in the secret doctrine is that each of the races develops a principle. Each of the races develops a principle. Seven principles, seven human races. And then she talks about the 49 fires, which is something else. So imagine what the first race was what she calls the Chayas. It was a projection from even a higher form than us. And as she points out, the primeval, the perfect form of all things is a sphere. So imagine before the world is even uh, semi-physical, vegetation, or all of those things, the, the sphere-like thing. And what is that but, of course, the auric egg? She said the first race never perished which is very interesting. The first race, they were semi-divine, but they had no consciousness. And of course, they were not beings like we with hands, feet, because development, evolution didn't need that. There was nothing to eat, so they didn't need a mouth. There was nothing to reach for, so they didn't need the hands, and going on through the other organs. So imagine a sphere. This, What is the oldest form of life on this planet, but the protozoa. And what are those protozoa but sphere-like creatures, right? 
Imagine the oldest, oldest forms of existence, the bacteria, are protozoa, somewhat sphere-like. So imagine then this auric egg, this sphere, that never, never perishes, which is still with us today. Then, of course, you have the second race, which again is just somewhat semi-aware. As the Earth begins to cool down, becomes more material, not, of course, matter as we know it, a somewhat gelatinous matter, you have then the development of this pattern body, the matrix, in turn, of life, which, of course, then develops these, this pattern body. The, we don't call it the etheric double, though you will see that in somewhat of the later literature. In fact, if you do a word search throughout all of HPV's writings, every single line, it only appears once, if this term, etheric double. She will speak of etheric and she will speak of double, never together. The only place it appears is in something attributed to her that was published in the 20th century, a very short piece. Actually, it's in, if you want to look at it, it's in the Blavatsky lecture I did in 2007 as an appendix. So she does not use this term, a theory double. So then imagine this sort of semi-jelly-like thing that forms the pattern, the basis. Yes, exactly. Uh, then, thirdly, right, what happens there? You have this great third race, the Lemurians, and as they say, this race was somewhat uh, androgynous, hermaphrodite. You know, Plato describes this primeval, primeval race as having both sexes, four hands, four legs, and he says it traveled by spinning itself. Uh, and as he points out, when it started moving, people got out of the way. <laughs> so you would have this rotating sphere, and of course, in the Platonic legend, this be these beings became so powerful that the gods decided to split them in half, right? They were, there were some that had both male-female, were female-female, and male-male, and the gods then split them in half into male and female. And the wonderful line from Plato is that the desire and pursuit of the whole, W-H-O-L-E, not H-O-L-E, that's something else, the desire and pursuit of the whole is called love is trying to find our other half, our, our completeness. Though, of course, it can be on a higher level also. So, in this third race, which she calls the Lemurians, you know, she's one of the first to use this idea of Lemuria, this continent that existed in the, in the Indian Ocean and into the Pacific. Uh, the idea that those statues on Easter Island are really the mountaintops of old Lemurian, the forms you see are not as of, but replications of these divine, be semi-divine beings. So, and they of course were gigantic. She gives the examples of those wonderful statues at Bamiyan which were destroyed by the Taliban in Afghanistan, those giant Buddha figures. And in this third race, desire awoke. Because previous to that, any form of reproduction was almost as you see in the simpler forms. It was either fission, a splitting apart of it, or a budding as you see in certain plants. So desire awoke. And she has some really interesting things to say about these uh, Lemurians. If I can find it for you. They, the Lemurians, built huge cities of rare earths and metals they built out of the fires, lava, vomited, out of the white stone of the mountains, 
and the black stone, they cut their own images in their size and likeness and worship them. The interesting thing about this Lemurian race also, <laughs> which 18 million years ago we begin to see the development of mind. So the form develops, but it does not develop mind. Mind then, seeing that the form is ready, then ensouls the form. This monastic element then begins to use the form. Of course, the fourth race, those great Atlanteans who we hear of and we see remnants of throughout the entire world, she said, they, the Atlanteans, built great images, 27 feet high, the size of their bodies, 27 feet high. Inner fires had destroyed the land of their fathers, the Lemurians. So imagine, 27 feet high. It's interesting, in Plato's description of Atlantis, he describes a city surrounded by seven rings of water. And when the conquistadors, the Spanish, came to what is now Mexico, their great cities that they discovered that were the Native American peoples, the Aztecs, it was a city surrounded by rings of water. That's how they kept out the people. And of course, the similarity between the pyramids in America and the pyramids in Egypt, of course, uh, modern archaeology says, well, that's just another coincidence, as that it's a coincidence today that Prometheus himself <laughs> has decided to come down to earth. You know, the divine life, through which finds its expression in us, is not some somber principle, as the Victorian theosophists might have thought, but is really, really has a sense of whimsy. Uh, you know, among the Hindus, they say, what, why did... The, why did the divine create the world? It was Leela, it was a play, it was a sport. So all of this is a play or sport of the gods, so to speak. You may remember as children seeing some of those movies about the gods in Olympus putting human figures in the arena and watching them develop. So then, so we have, of course, <coughs> the Orica, sort of the time capsule of you, all of your experiences. How does consciousness then travel from life to life if consciousness is an amorphous thing? How does it in turn, how does your individual consciousness develop unless there is this auric body, this, this gelatin capsule, so to speak, that eventually in the water loses its own separateness and becomes the one. So you have this time capsule where if you go to a psychic or a medium and they describe your dead husband or someone else, what they are seeing is all of those images, we talk about the Akashic Records, but each of you, all of those images are in that auric egg. It's this time capsule of all your lives' experiences. I, uh, I should correct myself because technically you never existed previously. Right? This is one of the distinctions. You were not so-and-so. You were not this person. That's a very crude way of looking at it, because you are truly unique and individual. Yes, that monadic essence may have had previous experiences, uh, and I tend to find that I am using more and more the term monad instead of the higher self or atma. Mm -hmm. And what is the monad, really? The monad is the extension of consciousness throughout a mandantara. So, uh, in the old days, they used to give examples of, well, uh, waves on the ocean. The sun is shining on the ocean, and you see all the sparkling uh, things on the, on the ocean. There's only truly one sun, but the sparkling there. Or in the Upanishads, they talk about sparks in the fire. Atman is the fire, and those are sparks. But I think a really, really good image for today is those of you who have ever seen a mirrored ball, a disco ball, right? with lots of little mirrors, you shoot one ray of light on it and it reflects myriads and myriads of patterns. And then, of course, if you start that ball moving, you have the whole dance of life going on. So imagine one beam of light on a mirrored ball creates myriads and myriads forms. 
what is the source of all of those forms but that one beam of light? I think it's a really graphic image to have us more understand the nature of our own individuality. And of course, once the party is over and the light is turned off, there's nothing else. Right? So you have this auric egg, you have the pattern body that then in turn <coughs> creates for us as we become more materialistic the physical form. As HPB in turn told her students, the body is not a principle. The bo physical body is not a principle. Um, you have, of course, kama, this desire, as animals do. If you didn't have any desires, we wouldn't want anything. We wouldn't eat. We wouldn't uh, do anything. There is an English novel from the 19th century called The Water Babies, which some of you may be familiar with. And it's, it's really quite charming. But among the characters in it are people who are sitting next to an anthill and are constantly being bitten but don't want to move. Right? They, it's inertia is their nature. So they constantly complain about being bitten, but they don't want to simply get up and move. So if we didn't have any desire, of course, procreation would not be possible. Uh, we would have no desire to the arts, music, food production, right? Then, of course, with the Atlanteans, the fourth, Kama and Manasto, this Kama monastic idea. It's not just simply desire alone. When we were at Murians, we were having a gay old time, right? Just having our emotions ruling us, right? But with the Atlanteans, who there are all of these legends of our primeval ancestors who created great cities, had great knowledge. But if you look at, for instance, the Aztecs in America, they created pyramids. Of course, the Mayans created the wheel, which, of course, you know, their calendar ends in 2012. So everyone is now jumping on this and saying 2012 will be the end of time. And I think, in fact, there is a movie coming out at the end of this year called 2012, which deals with the destruction of the world we know. It. The Aztecs had a great civilization, but they'd cut your heart out in a second and sacrifice you, you know. Uh, in fact, when the conquistadors came from... Uh, Europe, the Aztecs <clears throat> welcomed them as gods, they, they were very hospitable, and they gave them a drink that was only given for the gods, and it was a mixture of tequila, <laughs> cocoa, and cayenne pepper. And when they offered it to the conquistadors, <laughs> they drank this and were so enraged they slaughtered all the Aztecs. <laughs> But it was also a drink they gave to people who were sacrificed. So, of course, this can be another metaphysical meaning, taking out of the heart, right? If you drank a drink made of tequila, which is made from a cactus, imagine, humanity finds many ways to get drunk. <laughs> so, tequila, imagine cocoa, and then cayenne pepper. Well, you drank that, you would, you would love to have your heart ripped out at that point. You wouldn't mind being sacrificed. Anything but that, right? And then, of course, when we come to our own fifth race, which we are in, and of course, each race having seven subdivisions, uh, the Indian being the oldest, the European, of course, being the dominant race right now. Of course, if you tell other countries, uh, they would disagree with you. Our whole worldview is really shaped by Europe, regardless of where you live in this world. You cannot escape that a small country like England ruled the world, a small country like the Netherlands, I mean, ruled the world. These small countries literally colonized. Look at the way we see the planet, north and south, right? You know, up and down, North America, South America. But in space, is there really, how do we know? But we focused everything around the European world and then everything else was followed. So then Kama Manas, mind, desire, but desire tempered by mind. An unrestrained, um, what's the English word? An unrestrained indulgence of the appetites they found obviously just led to destruction. So it was, yes, but tempered by this mind. And of course, in our 
fifth race, mind truly now becomes to fully develop. But as HPB says, and those, those principles only fully come into being at the end of each race. So we are in the fifth sub-race of the fifth race. Not just mind is developing, but this buddhi manas, buddhi being the intuition. How do you know certain things? Think of people who are in a truly dramatic situation and they know just the right thing to do. You always hear this in a crisis. Oh, well, I just did this and this, even without thinking. You're right, rising above just the thought process. And of course, there is this sixth sub race still to come, which the Americans in the audience will be happy to hear. Blavatsky says that uh, the sixth sub-race will develop in America, of all places, and this is our quote. She says, our fifth root race has already been in existence as a race sui generis and quite free from its parent stem about one million years. Occult philosophy teaches that even now, under our very eyes, the new race and races are preparing to be formed and that it is in America that the transformation will take place and has already silently commenced. Thus the Americans have become in only three centuries a primary race before becoming a race apart and strongly separated from all other now existing races. They are, in short, the germs of the sixth sub-race and in some few hundred years more will become most decidedly the pioneers of that race which must succeed to the present European or fifth sub-race in all its new characteristics. After this, in about 25,000 years, they will launch into preparations for the seventh sub-race until, in consequence of catalysms, the first series of those which one day must destroy Europe, and still later the whole Aryan race, as also the lands directly connected with it, the sixth root race will appear on the stage of our round. So, as you know, uh, in fact, some years ago, in preparation for the millennium in the year 2000, the New York Times, which is a major newspaper in America, in its magazine section had a whole issue about the future, about the new, the new thousand years. And one of them was <coughs> this idea of a new race. And they gave, even now, you know, in other countries, people are pretty well ethnically separate. But of course, in America, it's a land of immigrants. Everyone is coming, and of course, one of the great ideas that you hear in America is the idea of it's a melting pot, right? All things come. So they gave, they actually had photos of children, so whose father was Irish and maybe mother was black, or Chinese and black, and in turn those children would marry and intermarry, and truly a new physical race would develop, and as we are truly seeing this in America. So, of course, the next race, the sixth race, the sixth sense, of course, is this booty intuition, the sixth sense. But, of course, it's latent with us, just like all those principles are there in the universe, but also latent. So, what's the principle left out? Tell me, you are all great students of theosophy. What is the principle, even using the old ones, what is the principle that has been left out? We've got the auric egg, we've got the pattern body, or the old, what they call the astral body. We have kama, we have kama manas, we have bodhi manas, which our work as theosophists is really to help the quickening of development. You know, people say, well, you know, things like the secret doctrine are so difficult. Well, of course, it's supposed to be because it's helping you develop that intuitional faculty. If you read it as a novel and didn't have to think, which is the older ways of doing it, what would develop? You know? So in a sense, we theosophists are like those first fish that crawled out laboriously onto land. We are crawling out to a new continent of thought. 
by developing these intuitional faculties. And if you want to develop your intuition, of course, get the secret doctrine, especially my edition. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you, you, you get this book and read it, and I swear to you, in 25,000 years, you will see the results. So, yes, the sixth race will be intuition. And she says also, the seventh race is also just really a summation. In, in all of her sevenfold scheme, the seventh is, if you look at the seal of the society, which is the six-pointed star, that little dot in the center is the synthesis, because by the time you read the seventh, it, the seventh is really the synthesis of all the others. So, what principle has been not mentioned? Life force. Prana. Prana, 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 prana. Technically, you can't say there's something without prana. Life is everywhere. We talk about the one life. It's interesting, in the old Upanishads, prana was the synonym for Atman. She talks about it was the life, right? So imagine going through this cycle, and finally by the time you reach this seventh race, you truly become one with life, right? But a divine, radiant life from the potentiality to potency. Now, also, um, one of the interesting things that she talks about, uh, if I can find it here for you, is that by awakening these faculties, it also helps the development of the planet. The planet, in turn, has its own seven principles, out of which humanity is its manas. Just think of it. So you have the vegetable life, you have the animal life, which would be the comic principle, Hum and of course you have the David lives beyond it. But humanity represents the manas of the planet. And as we rise and grow, uh, we truly will develop this great faculty. And in fact, uh, it'll be too long to look at it here, but she does say that the reason that things are in such a terrible shape in the world is that, in turn, our minds are in such a terrible shape. Remember, in her system, life precedes form. It's from within, without, right? It's from within, without. So, in turn, all the terrible things that are happening in the world are really the result of our own consciousness. So, if we were better people, the world would become a better place. It's just as simple as that. If we were to become kinder, more humane, all of the terrible natural catalysms would really not occur. I think David touched on this um, in one of his previous talks. So, yes, the seventh principle will then be truly prana. But of course, prana is not separate. There's not, you can't say you all have individual pranas. Prana is just the one life. So in turn, by the seventh race, we will truly achieve the things that we are constantly talking about in our literature, the truly universal brotherhood. You know, the original objects of the society, which were changed in the Theosophical Society, I believe in 1897, the first object had a slight change in wording, and I think truly the first object, as it was, is actually somewhat better than we use it. It was to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity. As we have it now, it's to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity. Because Mrs. Besson said universal brotherhood is a fact, but it's there in latency. So, as theosophists, our work, when we really work together, uh, David knows Nandini R. was at a conference in August, and she said to me, impersonality is being able to work with people you don't like. Mm -hmm. you know? Impersonality is being able to work with people you don't like. Many, many years ago, when I was at Adyar doing research in the archives, there was an old member called Sita Nilakantan, and we were walking along, and she said to me, that man's an ass, but he's a theosophist. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, you know, we, we made, it's, you know, it's ironic in our society that we are allowed to disagree. You know, every, in the, this freedom of thought, though as one old lady told me, it's freedom of thought as long as you keep it to yourself. 
<laughs> we have this each and we have truly no dogma, no belief. You can truly believe every wild and crazy thing you want, but you don't have the right to impose those beliefs on a, as someone else. So this idea of this unity, and especially the Theosophical Society, really works through group work. It's all about group work. What is a nucleus? Right? It's the core. Uh, in 2007, at the question and answer series that ends the convention, both John Algio, who was then international vice president, and Rada Bernie, the president, a question was given to the audience. Why are our numbers declining? This is what we hear. Why are our numbers declining? And John Algio pointed out, he said, our work was to form a nucleus. And what is a nucleus? But a very small group, right? We were not asked to convert the world to theosophy, but to form that nucleus. And when you have the nucleus, then it's the start of life. The embryo, right, starts with a little nucleus, and then things start developing. No one will deny that for such a small group, its ideas have been tremendously influential. Right? From a handful of people in the 19th century, these ideas are universal. Karma and reincarnation are part of common. Instant karma is going to get you, right? You, you know, all of these things, in a sense, our success has been the cause of our own failure because now these ideas are commonplace. And it's interesting, as theosophists, we are still laboriously reinventing the wheel while young people, we are still teaching them the ABCs, and young people are already in the M's and N's and O's. They know all these things, right? Tell me something I don't know. So this is why I think the European school is so great. This is, you know, one of my hobby horses. If you ever hear me at the Euro school, this is why it's so, 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 so great. And even unlike theosophical meetings or theosophical conventions, which is usually one country, one group, and even larger things like the, in our international conventions, when we meet in the Euro school, you can be a theosophist, non-theosophist, but you at least have to be interested. You have to have a keen interest. Because as Blavatsky says in the beginning of the key to theosophy, to the mentally lazy and obtuse, theosophy will ever remain a riddle. Right? Uh, there is a commercial we see in America constantly, which is uh, to ask you for donations for <coughs> colleges. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Right? So, Think of all the people you know in the outside world who are just happy with more cars, more material things. This, this quest for happiness on the material plane. And as you all read the, all the scandals and terrible things about all the celebrities, they're not truly happy because their lives are in turmoil. They have everything everybody else wishes, but they have the one thing that we have that they don't have they don't really have that peace of mind, right? And it's ironic, you get that peace of mind by in turn rising above the mind, right? So when we meet as, as groups like this, it's truly the most wonderful, wonderful thing. In a sense, we are creating that nucleus. Some of the older generation theosophists in the first quarter of the 20th century, like Bledbeater and all of those would say, you know, he has a little pamphlet, the hidden side of large meetings. When we meet, the David forces then float through us. Well, that's one way of speaking, but truly something very, very magical happens. And those of you who have been through this week, who have been through other schools, you cannot deny that something truly wonderful happens. And it isn't just the lectures. It's the talking afterwards. It's all of the interaction, so to speak. In a sense, the lectures are just the hook to mm -hmm. get you here, and then what you do individually is really is the, is the wonderful thing. So, I'm going to ask now any, I, I love to hear your questions and your examples. Any questions, any, or you're just stunned into silence? <coughs> yes. I'd like to hear about the uh, crystal children, if there's anything about the uh, crystal children, or we call Indian goat children. Well, that's simply an example, but as she says, don't get into this idea that the sixth race is already here. You know, with the races, there's always an overlapping. 
we don't suddenly go from daylight to midnight, dark light. There is always this overlapping. So, of course, there is this development. But remember, in every race, there are, in turn, seven sub-races, right? So we are seeing this development. Technically, what you talk about are where we should be, because we have been a little slow in uh, development. So this is just another example of you really are all of those also. Remember, the, the theosophical idea is like the platonic idea. You know everything already. The monad, right, which is truly just an unfolding of consciousness from awareness to self-consciousness to a full, truly consciousness, right? Uh, in the old literature, you would talk about the mineral monad, the animal monad. They're really, that's a misconception. It's the monad, in turn, mm -hmm. experiencing through exactly. the mineral kingdom. The monad, in turn, the physical actually develops so the monad can express itself. Mm -hmm. right? This is a really interesting idea. Not, mm -hmm. not that anything here is created. Mm -hmm. All of creation, then, becomes the means for the monad to fully express itself. So you can't say it's a mineral monad, it's an animal monad, you know, a vegetable monad. It's the monad experiencing this vegetable state, experiencing those other states. And so imagine the basis of each one of you is a consciousness that has had innumerable lives, innumerable experiences. Uh, in the old days, in the old Theosophists, they, they used to, one of the lines was, in our past lives, we had many husbands and wives, right? You know, so imagine truly at your basis is this unlimited potential. You know it. It's just being able to access that information. For instance, like a computer. If you know how to access it, you can draw anything you want from the computer. If you don't know how to use the computer, you really can't access that information. And the image that Blavatsky gives in The Voice of the Silence is the mind is like a mirror. It gathers dust as it reflects. It needs the gentle breezes of soul wisdom you know, to bring that out. It needs some effort. The personality has to go through intense <coughs> suffering. You have to truly be unhappy. And this is the wonderful thing. Unless you have tasted true unhappiness, which we all run from, and those of you who are young, whenever I see young children crying, I said, I always say, don't cry. You'll have enough opportunities later in life, right? <laughs> you know, but it's ironic because sometimes it's the painful things in life that make us then turn to the spiritual. If life was blissful and happy, well, what, what would I need? I'll, I'll, the material, all my needs are given in the material world. But sometimes, what creates the pearl in the oyster, right? that one little grain of sand that becomes the irritant and in turn the oyster then makes this wonderful thing, the pearl of great price, within that shell. So sometimes it's those little things that keep prodding us along. And all of our teachings are just an excuse to make you turn toward that true inner self, that true divine. Uh, I once saw somebody give a title of a lecture, Awakening the Inner Self. Well, no, the inner self is awake. You're the one who's asleep. <laughs> you know, the inner self is always there. It's like, I've often seen the image. Have you seen, ever seen someone walking? The sun is shining, and they're walking with their heads down in the shadow. You know, the, the sun is there shining on them, but they're so caught up in their own limited problems. And if you simply let go of your problems, they solve themselves, because... Truly, the spiritual life is a great love affair. It's a love of the divine, right? As the poem that David <coughs> edited today, it isn't an intellectual pursuit. It isn't a dry thing. It's truly a love affair. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, I was going to say self-love, but that has another aspect, so perhaps we won't use that idea. But it really is a love of not only an individual self, but all of humanity shares that one divine. You know, if you can see, that's what brotherhood is so great. If you see that true spark in everyone, then it, the world is transformed, right? Anyone else? Yes. 
one of the things, Michael, that um, I often ask people about and think a lot about is, I mean, during my lifetime, the population of the world has gone up around about 350%, and in, in the last century it's gone up probably 600% from one to nearly 7 mm -hmm. billion people. What, <coughs> what are your thoughts on why this is happening, or the implications of it, or um, certainly the development of it? Well, I certainly don't have to tell you why people are reading, how, how the creative process is, is making the world, but the usual thing, you know, in theosophy, we're always sort of given the idea that there is a period between incarnations. We don't sort of believe in this quickie reincarnation, nor do we believe in metempsychosis, that if you're born in a human, then you could be reborn as an animal, because that's retrograde. Progress is happening. Now, of course, Blavatsky's answer would be, and in fact, in these notes, she also uh, gives this. She says, well, how do you know that the populations in the past weren't even greater than they are today? Uh, but there is something that she did talk to her students about that you rarely find in the theosophical literature, which is the human elemental. There's a line in one of the Mahatma letters where they speak about someone who is born too soon in human form, right? And think about people who do the most cruel, heartless crimes. Think of the people who kill other people while that person is pleading and begging for their life. Is there a monad with that? Is there truly anything there, right? How can you have any sort of compassion? There was a case about someone who, a pregnant mother who killed her and cut out, you know, the unborn child. The most cruel, uh, so in, a, so in a sense, perhaps, uh, uh, she also refers to this, so she says, uh, sort of that Frankenstein monster is there with us. So, yes, the population is greater, but perhaps all of that population may not truly be the human population as we know it, right? You know, it could, it's, you know, not everyone, as you know with her, one of her ideas is, no, Unlike the Christian idea that a soul is created for each individual, no, right? The form is created and then it's ensouled. And in fact, in theosophical teaching, till the age of seven, the monad doesn't fully take control mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the, the form. This is why the rare exceptions in reincarnation, if a child dies before seven, it's reincarnated mm -hmm. almost immediately because it hasn't had time to develop. Mm -hmm. The faculties aren't developed. Uh, I would truly say this, I've thought about this also, and I've asked many other theosophists uh, why this is the case, where, you know, they're, because also, just think, the majority of people in this world, you know, you are the most fortunate of all fortunate people in this world, because you have found that great pearl of price. The majority of other people just live in a material existence. Think of people who have to walk miles for water, and it's always, of course, the women they send out. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a movie called La Cage aux Fals, which was about uh, someone who uh, was uh, dressed as a woman. It was a man who was, I mean, one of the things is they went to Italy, they had to go to Italy, and there in Italy, the women did all the work in the fields. And he said, I don't want to be a woman in this country. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you just think of all, you know, in other countries and things like that, it's the women who truly do the rack baking work while the men stay and smoke and, and talk. Uh, John, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, to, uh, to point uh, out the compatibility, you know, with... Uh, the Buddhist teaching, you know, or Madame Blavatsky was a Buddhist, uh, that, uh, you know, liberation and that I personally, you know, don't have to wait for the rest of you all to come, <laughs> you know, and that I personally at any moment can break, and it's my job, mm -hmm. to break this uh, waiting period, you know, and not have to go through whatever millions of years. I would just be interested in the compatibility between this evolutionary theory and this fact as it explained as a fact mm -hmm. that I personally, I don't have to wait. Well, technically, you, the personality doesn't really do anything, you know. This is one of the mistakes we, we look, you know, we think we are going to achieve enlightenment. <laughs> you don't, because if it was that, if it was possible, there'd be more enlightened people in our time, you know. If there was, 
This is one of Krishnamurti's things. If there was a method or a means, uh, more people would be enlightened. You think we'd all sit here and we'd love to be enlightened. We'd love to be spiritual teachers and go around, you know, if we could, if we could have that. So technically, there's a lovely line in the Upanishads that says, Atman chooses the person, not the person chooses Atman, right? That, so imagine, the physical evolution is there, then as David pointed out this morning, the monastic, the mind then, ensouls the form, but beyond that is that monadic form that has gone through many other rounds, as we would say in theosophy, not just our present round, right? So that divine self then, in turn, is the thing that gives that awareness. And people think, well, we do all of these things, but perhaps it's the other way around. The divine self has prepared you, so to speak, prepared you the way. So it's prepared the way, and yet we think we're doing something, but actually it is. This is actually a question I would say, ask David Roth. My, my way of getting out of all of these things is, ask David Roth. <laughs> yes, and here he's going to answer you. Yes. Well, there are... I, I struggled with that question too, but maybe we should take into regard that although this universe is um, from a certain perspective imperfect and it should be, it's also infinite compassionate as a basis. Huh? The, 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 uh, the, 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 divin the divinity embraces also the relative and, uh, and the imperfections. So from that perspective, we have or most beings have time for evolution. It doesn't mean that you can get out of it <coughs> sooner than the plan allows you to. There's another aspect maybe, and that's more a, a, a mystical uh, approach for me to understand it, and I don't know whether it's correct. It's only a suggestion to think about. Maybe we have to get used to the idea that Enlightenment is not the end, but the mm. first step to begin evolution at all. Yes, that's a what we have now called, until now, evolution is really preparatory. There is a sentence in the SD that she calls all the kingdoms until the human kingdom preparatory kingdoms. Which means, I think, that what Buddhists would call enlightenment is for us really, and make a big deal out of it, from an esoteric perspective, would make me be opening the door of evolution. Maybe then true evolution can begin, and not in a dialectical way of good, bad, good, bad, always the same thing, but from good to good to good to good to good to good. For us, good is always succeeded with evil, but real evolution may be an infinite uh, expression of potentialities. And how can that, that can only happen when that potentiality is triggered? Yes, very true. And then also... It's only a suggestion, eh? All of these things, you know, Krishnamurti, who I actually had the privilege of hearing uh, at Adyar many times. In fact, I was there for his last talks, and it was quite interesting, you know. At his very last talk, he would, he would speak exactly to the time without a watch, <coughs> then stop and get up and go. But the very last talk, he said, and he, supposedly he knew that he was going to die, he knew the time. He said at the end of it, shall we just have a few moments together in silence? And the audience was so slow because they were, the previous talks he would stop, get up, namaste, and go out. So, uh, in, in, what Krishnamurti would say to you, well then, in asking the question is the answer. So is the glass half full or half empty, right? Of course, if I drink it, that solves the problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to drink it for you, right? You, know, you have to drink it yourself. Uh, these are all wonderful things and, of course, things that we can discuss. And I don't think one person... I can certainly give you my interpretation and my impression, but when we meet together, and of course these discussions go on past when we uh, finish the lectures, I'm just going to end with uh, this quote that I was looking for about, this, this describes it, uh, these two, some of HPB's ideas, and they're not in print, so this is the first time, you're so see how special you are, you're hearing these for the very, 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 very first time. Of course, I knew it already, but it's another story. <laughs> uh, so this is, I'll just give you these quotes, and then we'll end. We hope to, we hope to publish, have them published by next year. These are actually her, her conversations, and they took it down in stenographic form. To think 
that we have been angels and have become, what, such pumpkins, knowing nothing at all, to think we have been ornamented with beautiful wings, and where are they? Gentlemen, you are very much addicted to questioning, and you really ought not to pry into the mysteries of God. This is one of, when they asked her some of these questions. Um, she also says, the earth has its physical, this is the idea I wanted to bring to you before, the earth has its physical or material body, its astral body, its life principle, its animal nature, its instincts or lower manners, its higher intelligence, which it imparts to and shares with some animals, its buddhi, and its atman, represented by an intelligence called the spirit of the earth. And she says, the sins of humanity affect the earth, and the joys of humanity affect the earth. And you will see that when humanity is at its worst, then they will have neither harvest nor anything growing, and the earth will be in perfect stability and despair. So the idea that, you know, and this is now something that has become into common parlance that, you know, especially here in Europe, America, even though they may be the home of the six subways, they're slow catching on with this. In America, the green, you know, in Europe, the green movement has caught on tremendously that, you know, you have an effect, your carbon footprint, all of those things. We had 75 years, you know, in the 20th century where nobody cared about anything. We were burning and burning fuel like there was no tomorrow. We didn't care. Uh, but just because somebody becomes concerned can make the difference. In America, they have, uh, they sell tuna in cans. And a group of high school students went to an aquarium in Florida called SeaWorld, and they found out that when they have these huge nets pulling for tuna, dolphin get caught in them, right? The dolphin have to come to the surface to breathe. And they began writing to people and to congressmen and their representatives, and now almost every can of tuna will say it's dolphin free. They made the change. But before that, didn't matter, who cared, right? And then this cautionary word is, to quote David, right? After you take the pill, now a warning. <laughs> uh, this is what she says. I'll end on this note. Go where you like. You find there is not a thing that is done that is not done with selfish motives and so as to benefit all oneself or nation or individual and that the others would be losers thereby. It is something terrible when you come to look at the present state of business, of life, of civilization. This civilization is the cancer of humanity. It will be the ruin of humanity in the way it is conducted. I do not say civilization as it ought to be. It is the most gigantic development of selfishness that was ever known. And I can assure you that the fifth race will go out with a great flourish of trumpets, which will be other than the trumpets of a war cry. So, again, you meant, so, you know, we think we just study and we just have these little ideas and so what. But really, you know, even if you read the Mahatma letters, what was the purpose of starting this society? This is one of the things they said because literally the nations, the whole culture, could perish if it went on that way without this journey. Imagine, say something like the Theosophical Society hadn't come into existence. We would have had either a totally materialistic world or a totally fundamentalist world. Mm -hmm. Fundamentalist religion, science with its going to the nth degree. And who would be in the middle to say, no, here's the alternative to these views, right? So, so the work you are all doing, especially when you come to the European school, you're saving humanity. Right? <laughs> so don't think, and there's no, you can't, there's no price on that, right? And so, again, karma, technically, this is one of the things she says in her notes, she says there's also a karma for game kings and leaders. Say people who send people to war. Think of their karma, you know, for killing, being the cause to have thousands of people killed. She has a story called Karmic Visions, which is a very interesting story where she's dealing with it, uh, not Bismarck, uh, no, no, no. a German leader at the time who developed, he was Frederick. Frederick, and he developed cancer. And she shows that he was actually Clovis the Great in his past life and how 
he then had this revelation, but it was too late by the time he had this understanding, and the war drums then started for Europe. So the good karma, of course, will partly go to Thomas for inviting us here. You know. And of course, any time we meet anywhere, the weather, as you know, has been beautiful. So Hungary, of course, will develop like a beautiful garden, right? And since it's almost that time for lunch, we will now go to the garden of eating. <laughs> so thank you very much.